Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. I am your host, James Just. With me today, 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 today is my favorite author and should be your favorite author, Mr. Sean Cameron. Well, well, thanks for having me here today, today. <laughs> I'm happy to be today. It's one of those days, Sean. Yes. It's, it's been one of those days all day. And, oh, man. Which is actually kind of an interesting thing because our top of the the charts here, our top of the, this is going to be a long night. Yeah. Our, our top topic? <laughs> our top topic, thank you, our is on free topic. speech, which apparently I'm having trouble with tonight. You're having trouble with speech. I'm having trouble with speech tonight, it is. So we've got two stories here that kind of combine, if memory serves. If we can get the, uh, the first one up. We've got a question, <laughs> as has been asked many times in these last couple years. Is free speech ever violent? And that's a uh, that's an interesting. I was on the wrong page. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a long show. Uh, <laughs> so, is free speech ever violence? And you know, the the concept of that is that um, you know, if you say words mm. that can cause social unrest, mm. right? Is mm. does that speech lead to violence? Mm. And the the short answer is it can, but mm. that's the whole point of the First Amendment mm. is to be able to drive up social unrest if it is needed. Mm. That's the literal whole point of it, mm -hmm. is it not? Mm -hmm. our, our, our nation was founded, our founders, I won't say fa fathers, you know, this happened to be all guys. They were all young capitalists, most of them, some of them were very old, they'd be, be old men. And they, uh, they believed in the shake in the box, and they, they knew that, and somehow we've forgotten it, that dissent is important, and uh, that hearing different viewpoints is important, and that only through that will we learn, and, and can you have the, the vibrancy of, uh, of, you know, a growing new country, you know, our country was a baby, and it's grown up pretty well, and and now, you know, we're trying to kill it off. But I, I'm still, and I know our thousands of viewers, I, you, you'll probably get, you know, a whole bunch of emails complaining about me saying this over and over again. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. They might hurt my feelings. Now, if, if you put out the words, uh, yeah, John's going to be on vacation from this date to this date, and he happens to have something in his house, and I know for a fact his burglar alarm's not down, the burglar alarm's down, then, you know, you might be able to make a point that that's, I don't know, inciting somebody to go rob your home. But if you just, well, the, for example, the, the people, uh, the, the socialists in the country or whatever you call them, um, the people who believe in government control, say repeatedly uh, in print that, that uh, um, Trump is a danger to democracy. Now, if... If somebody else said that about um, Harris or Biden or Weiss or any of those people, it would probably be taken as, as um, inciting people to violence. I mean, if you label somebody a danger to the fabric of our society, then is that inciting somebody? But what bothers me is that um, they want to control speech at all. Yeah. And think they have the right. And they're so ignorant, they believe that the uh, First Amendment had, had uh, caveats to it. It said, uh, oh, you know, if it hurts people's feelings or if it disagrees with the narrative or uh, if we think it's wrong or we, if we think it's, uh, you know, biased, then we should be able to control it. And that's not the case. I mean, free speech is free speech. Yeah, it, it's it, that easy. It's the whole point. We want to go back to your, your example for a minute. If someone, there's two remedies for that. Mm -hmm. if, if someone were to, you know, Give it, John's gone on vacation and mm. you know, his house is vulnerable, blah, 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 blah. There's actually two things. One, the person who actually robs your house is committing a crime and they yeah. should go to jail, right, properly. Yeah. And you actually could sue the other one through civil court. Yeah. And that's the remedy. You don't need yeah. big government. Yeah. You don't need any more free speech. Yeah. We, the remedies already exist for that. Oh, yeah. Remedies exist. And, and, you know, if in that point, thank you for taking it to the level I didn't get to because I kind of meandered off my point. <laughs> um, you know, very, very, very few. I mean, uh, you can sue people for libel. Uh, you can sue people 
I think for plagiarism, for copyright violation. These are all property right issues here. Yep. You can you know, the property of your um, of your reputation uh, if it's sullied and impacts you financially. And these are all civil remedies. But when these people, uh, what these people want to do is criminalize speech, not have it civil. Well, the EU is a whole other thing. They well, basically want to sue Elon in the non-existence because he won't couch out of their censorship. So that's civil. But, but these people want to criminalize speech. And in England, they've thrown people in jail for online speech, criminally. Yeah, and this is what I want to bring up is, you know, it wasn't that long ago where Democrats were the ones who championed free speech. Mm. They actually used free speech to get many of their, of their social issues mm. to become mainstream. Yeah. They use that free speech, speech that would have at that time been considered hate speech yeah. or, or uh, cause social disruption, mm -hmm. whatever the kind of we want to use. Mm -hmm. That same speech that now that they have that freedom, now that they're they in are control, the ones, they are in control <laughs> or they believe they are in control yeah. or believe they should have control, that now they want to be able to control speech that is counter to their culture, to mm -hmm. their wants, to their Imagine needs, to that. their desires. And, Imagine that. Kind of makes you wonder, don't it? But, you know, I brought up, there was something, you know, one of the things that actually scared me about Democrats, and I brought this up years ago, five, ten years ago, is that anybody who's willing to reimagine the, the definition of the Second Amendment mm -hmm. will reimagine the definition of the first. Mm -hmm. They just will. And because the they don't respect the definitions that we have all agreed to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just like, you know, the, the uh, First Amendment is pretty sh sweet and simple. You have the right to bear arms. And I have people argue in, uh, in uh, uh, what is it, a militia or something like that is in there. But they, they say, well, if the comma was in there like it should have been, then people would understand that the militia has the right to, and people don't. And I said, no, you have to take um, the Constitution in the context of the time it was written. And at that time, people um, could bear any kinds of arms at all. You could have a cannon. People didn't think it was a bad idea. You could have a sword. You could have a catapult. You could have the best weapons, the highest tech weapons uh, were in the hands of private citizenry because of their fear of the state. Yeah. And it, wasn't, it wasn't to protect them, so it wasn't to, to go hunting, although they used to say weapons to hunt. It was flat out so that the next time uh, the despots who are in power uh, try to uh, take our property or our freedoms or our speech or house troops in our houses, then we can do something about it. And anybody who reads the history of this country and says anything different is either stupid or a liar or both. Yeah, it's well, that simple. Yeah, it's deliberately misunderstanding history, yeah. which, of course, is one of the reasons they don't teach it in school. Mm. They don't teach history properly in school because mm. if they did, they would... You know, people be asking, hey, what about this Tenth Amendment thing? Mm. <laughs> you know, is anybody even taught the Tenth mm. Amendment? You know, the limitations of government? The, mm. if, the federal, if it's not expressly written in the Constitution, the federal government doesn't have the power? Yeah. And yeah, we just completely ignored that. Yeah. We now have, we have been, I, I read it somewhere, we have been a country for 248 years. We have 483 federal agencies. Mm. Do we really? Yeah. So it's like two per year. It, it, yeah, except it, for they all happened since the 1970s. It's, it's insane yeah. how, how many of, uh, how when far some, we have slipped. When some, when some uh, and I don't want, let's not ever use the word liberal to describe them. Some socialist or, or uh, totalitarian types put um, judges in place uh, who thought the same way they did and created all of this um, completely unconstitutional uh, these letter agencies are completely unconstitutional because the legislative, executive, and judicial rest in the power of one person inside one of these agencies. You can't touch them. But recent court decisions have rolled that back. And people think it's the radical conservative judges. Um, act, no, basically it's reversing the damage that was done in the 70s when all these things like Chevron and, and all these letter agencies were approved and they just didn't think it through. I mean, Reagan almost closed down the national education, so whatever that big uh, pipeline for slush fund for democratic causes is that we actually yeah, pay the tax NEA, dollars the for. National the National Endowment NEA. for the Arts, right? No, yeah, well, that one too. Yeah. And, and after he, he was having second thoughts, right after he signed that into law, you know, the teachers, you know, take this money to support 
themselves, basically. I know we're beating freedom of speech all the way up, but you know who would probably put it in? Well, that's your job, though. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a good lead-in, because Richard always has a good perspective, and he's been around long enough as a reporter. Yeah, well, he to, remembers the, to the founding fathers. Yeah, <laughs> to yeah. understand what free I speech... Think he, I think he went to school with some of them. Used yeah. to be in what it is now. So let's hear Richard Fields this week. <laughs> he's not that old, folks. Nobody is. Hi, this is Richard Fields with this week's report from the Fields. Our democracy is in danger if Trump is elected according to Democrats. They may be right. They would also be right in making the same charge if Kamala gets elected. Never mind that actually we're a republic with democracy limited by checks and balances and a constitution to prevent dictatorial majority from uh, a, a third world one election. Uh, we get to rule in per per perpetuity syndrome. The issue Democrats want you to forget is that a democracy, however constructed or limited, needs free speech to function properly. And Democrats are saying the quiet part out loud. They oppose free speech that they disagree with. Former Democratic Senator, presidential candidate, and Secretary of State John Kerry, speaking to the World Economic Forum, said, but look, if people go to only one source, and the source they go to is sick and has an agenda, and they're putting out disinformation, our First Amendment stands as a major block to the ability to hammer out, hammer it out of existence. Hmm. Former presidential spouse, Democratic candidate for president, senator, and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in a CNN interview said she wants to get rid of Section 230 which protects internet platforms from being sued for what their users of the platform say. She said, and I quote, if the platforms don't moderate and monitor the content, we lose total control. Total control, that's what it's about. Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren are also calling for weakening Section 230. But don't worry, freedom of speech is an equal opportunity target. Donald Trump wants to repeal Section 30 also. It's not really necessary. As the Twitter files convincingly demonstrated during the Biden-Harris administration, federal regulatory and law enforcement agency, agencies, from the FBI to the Department of Homeland Security to the National Institutes of Health, got the various platforms from Twitter to Facebook to YouTube to crumple like cheap suits under the implied threat of more onerous regulation. And it's not just in the United States. In Ireland, Britain, Brazil, Australia, and elsewhere, there are serious government efforts to drastically limit free speech. This just in, in Brazil, the Brazilian effort to limit free speech uh, apparently has been helped by the Biden administration sending uh, FBI people to help Brazil figure out how to do it properly, censor that is. This reporter has felt the effects. Prior to 2020, my posts on Facebook received hundreds of likes and shares. After I started posting serious questions about the government's narrative on COVID, my posts mysteriously stopped being reposted. Incidentally, most of my posts criticizing COVID policy turned out to be correct and correctly identify the lies that we were being told by the self-same government that was censoring me. Yes, democracy is at risk in this election, but more to the point, free speech is at risk no matter who wins. And without free speech, democracy, any variety of democracy, becomes a dead letter. That's this week's report from the fields. I'm Richard Fields. See you again next week if I make it past the censors. People are so... Oh, that's it. All right. Thank you, Richard. You know, it's always interesting to hear Richard's perspective as someone who's been in the business of media for mm. a long time. Well, he's find... been in media since like 60s or early 70s, right? Yeah, it's yeah. It, as long as I've been alive, I suspect Richard has been in the media and yeah. I'm getting old. Yeah. So it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're... I'm not old yet, John, I'm getting there. No, uh, no, I was just thinking, are, are you old enough to be like, am I old enough to be your dad? Yep. Well, John, in a month, I get, you know, I, I hit the thing where I can, like, join AARP and get the 55-year-old benefits 
and all that stuff. Yeah, that I get treated fine. as an old person. I can get a discount on my cell phone plan for being old uh, yeah. in a month. Yeah. yeah, yay me. Yeah, I can I can go up and ski pretty much all ski season for nothing. Because they don't figure people my age can do more than one run. <laughs> They're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, people my age, I can't do more than one run. No. But talk, <laughs> So we're going to move on. We've got uh, schools. We're talking some schools here, John, here for, for, for quickly. It's behaving badly? Behaving very, very badly. Yeah. And my question is, why aren't we discussing this more often? Our, the trouble that we're actually having in our schools. Uh, um, in this particular case, we've got an Elk Grove teacher you know, was the union had a seat that that barred white people from applying for it, and so was it, it the, the union or something yeah. else on campus? Yeah, the union had a seat that barred. So yeah, it was only only people of uh, color, or they had to be LBGT. I don't remember the rest of the initials. They had to be disabled, and he um, fulfilled none of those criteria. And he said. Wait a second, that's discrimination ensued. And shockingly, it turned out that it was. Yeah. So they, they uh, um, issued an apology and wrote him a check. And he said, I wasn't, I'm not even going to take the money for myself. I'm going to use it to establish an, a uh, um, scholarship for kids. But the idea that how many times, it, well, first of all, Constitution specifically spells out, we had an amendment to make sure that that stuff didn't happen that you can't discriminate based on race or national origin or sex or all that other stuff, right? And then the people in the glorious state of California repeatedly said, despite what the politicians want to do, at the, at the voting booth, <laughs> no, you can't admit more people of a certain, of certain color uh, into colleges because of that color or less of another color into colleges because of that color. And you can't do it for religion, and you can't do it for political party or anything else. And they keep doing it. And it is, it is basically an invitation to a lawsuit. You might as well just throw the taxpayer's money out onto the street or burn it. Yeah, and, and yeah. The, the solution is actually you just use, you use the economics of the area, right? Mm -hmm. If you really wanted to, to balance that out, you use economics. Mm -hmm. You go to the poor areas and you give, if you come from an economically troubled area, you get a, an advantage in mm -hmm. college applications, right? Mm -hmm. You could do that. Mm -hmm. That is actually a, a, one of the things that's actually legal to do. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted to do it, they could, but they mm -hmm. don't because mm -hmm. they want control. There's no yeah. control that way. No control. There's, and that way, there's a line. It's very simple. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's no control. And yeah. the only problem with that is that they've they've force fed people who uh, were less qualified into some of these quote unquote elite universities. And I say quote unquote because look at the people that are turning out. Um, a lot of them can't even read a book. They literally have, have can't read a book. They they put people into these universities that don't have the study habits or the skills or the background or the knowledge to um, they fail, you know, because they, they're not prepped. So really, the, the only reason for admittance to something would be that you have this bar and everybody has to jump over this bar, you know, and it's an SAT and it's your GPA because the greatest predictor of future academic success is past academic success because it proves that, unless they're cooking the books, well, it proves that you're willing to study. Is, willing is that, to study. And that yeah. is, people, people talk about all these, I'm going to go off real quick and then we we'll move on. I apologize. I'm no, no, we're all good because this next seconds. one is, well, we'll do this next one real quick. Yeah. Go ahead, finish. So, you know, people talk about all these reasons why, you know, Asian kids do better and Jewish kids do better and white kids do better and, and other groups don't do, us, do so well. But any valid study that drills down comes up with one answer. It's not, you know, the hiring of tutors. It's not the fact that they're, you know, or anything. It's who studies the most. Yeah, we'll discuss that. We can actually forget to it at the yeah. end. We've got a topic about right. that. So from uh, the great old England, right, mm -hmm. this is why these universities are failing. This yeah. is actually a perfect example. They filed a university professor who spoke out against... And this was a, the articles from the UK, yeah. but the guys in the States. So Yeah, yeah so they, they fired him because he spoke out against... Uh, trans surgery for children. Mm -hmm. Now, regardless of what you feel on the issue, in a university setting, should you not be allowed to, to have mm -hmm. this discussion? And he didn't have it in the university setting. He had it on a panel show 
that wasn't on the university. He 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 said what they what they fired him for was not even on school grounds. And now it's turning out that he was absolutely right. There's been 14,000 of these surgeries on kids, and this this guy's the expert in this field and has a chair in it. And and they fired him because he didn't um, he didn't kowtow to the current um, position. On yeah, it. and yeah. which is interesting because in Europe, where they actually jumped onto this bandwagon early, and they've, they've actually gone back. Of it. They've all gone all the way off of it. They've yeah. gone all the way off of it because what they found out was the reason there was high success early on. Mm. The reason it looked like there was high success because it was very hard to get through the mm. process. Mm. By the time you got through the process, those who got through the process really had no other options. It was a yeah. treatment of last resort. Yeah. But all the other kids peeled off at some point during the process. Mm. They got the help they needed, they got yeah. the services they needed, yeah. and so they didn't need the surgery. Yeah. And what happened was they circumvented that process, yeah. and by circumventing that process, you actually forced a bunch of kids who that was not the proper mm. solution and for. And these aren't reversible. If you give, you give somebody, a, if you give a, a, uh, a puberty age or pre-puberty age young woman a whole bunch of steroids, there is irreversible damage. It's not, you can't give another pill and it goes backwards. Their vocal cords will be permanently changed. Some other things that, that should happen to them won't. They won't be able to bear children later in life. Uh, and they're never, and male organs aren't going to suddenly pop out of their bodies. So that just doesn't happen. So, you know, it was, it was built on lies, and, and he called it out early, and they fired him. And you can't fire people for a difference of opinion. Yeah, it's. Well, you can fire anybody if you want, if you're private. Private, private organization. Company. Yeah. I don't like your shoes. You're out of here, bro. <laughs> I'm fine with that. But, you know, if you're a public entity, especially one that's paid for by tax dollars, then you can't do that stuff. Yeah, and it's, but it's also the, the, if the students and the universities themselves can't handle, you know, a difference of opinion on mm -hmm. facts and studies, and if you can't handle this discourse, you have no business being in university. So we're going to move on, John, to mm -hmm. uh, governments are making... The monopoly on governments deciding who gets kidneys mm -hmm. and who doesn't, or yeah. the government-appointed program, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. actually not government that does it. The government has given well, they, authority to yeah, some. There's, there's a, in every single state, there's a government-granted monopoly to decide uh, what happens to donated kidneys. And other organs, right? It's not and just kidneys. Organs. Kidneys are kidneys, just the Kidneys, eyeballs, everything else. Yeah. I think some you can sell. Um, and, and because of that, and these various things aren't interconnected state by state, um, and um, they do a terrible job of, of uh, deciding who gets what when. There's no financial incentive for people to donate organs because they think somehow that's wrong. Like kidneys, hey, everybody, we got two of them. What's wrong with selling one of them? And people say, oh, no, you're going to have poor people selling a kidney. Hold on. If somebody has, can get $50,000 for a kidney and in their country, and they got healthy kidneys, they can buy 40 acres and a mule and assure that their six children are going to starve to death, who's to tell them not to do that? Well, and I don't think as many people are going to be willing to sell their... Healthy people aren't going to just line up at the door to sell their kidneys if they... Right? It's not going to happen on mass scale. But what might happen is people who pass away for some reason mm. might be willing to sell those kidneys mm. at, at a higher rate. Mm. right? People who now aren't willing to be organ donors. Hey, if I can get ten grand for my children from, for giving up my organs, mm. I may be willing to donate my organs. Yeah, but if you get nothing. If you get nothing, why are you going to do no. it? No, I, yeah. want those, I want those very healthy kidneys. I died from cancer. But my, my kidneys weren't trashed for some reason through, through the chemo and all the rest of that. My eyes are in great shape. Okay, you're not going to need money for it. Fine. When you, when you burn all the rest of me and put me in the little box of ashes, have those healthy eyeballs in there as well. It makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, it, it makes no sense. Yeah. And talk about something else that makes no sense, John. We're going to move on because we want to get through some of these Does it have quick. to do with the government? Yes. Well, SCOTUS. Yeah. Take on New York's latest eminent domain scam. So quickly, John, so. what happened on this one? Well, this is, you know, basically it's, it's people targeting things that they don't like uh, with, the, with the scam. And eminent domain says that the government can take your property for government use. I don't see a camera on. Uh, for government use. Oh, there it is. Hi. 
uh, but they have to pay you for it, right? And um, so the court says, okay, you're taking it for government use. What these governments did is they decided in New York they didn't like this particular business, and so they, they threw up all these barriers, and finally all the barriers went away, and then they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to take this uh, uh, land from you, and we'll, we'll, we'll pay you for it. Hopefully they got paid for it. And, and it's going to be a, an unimproved park. What is an unimproved park? A field, an empty field. They didn't want this business so bad that they were going to pay people for their land, that they were going to turn it into a thriving business, because they already have one, that was going to produce a lot of jobs and a lot of tax revenue, and leave it like a fallow field. So um, the, the local circuit, I think the second circuit, agreed that it was OK to do that. But the, uh, um, the, uh, I think the Supreme Court's going to take it, or they've asked the Supreme Court to take it. Yeah, and the, this, is, this is the opportunity for the Supreme Court to fix a major mistake yeah. they made, right? Yeah. Because the same thing happened to the, what, oh, what was the name of the, the case? The Pink House. Yeah, the little, little pink, pink house, house yeah. and they actually never built any development there. Right, it's yeah. just sitting empty. It's took her house a, for literally no reason. Yeah, no reason, and I, right. IJ represented, and and nothing happened. And it's happened over and over and over again. And the Supreme Court has admitted that they've made a mistake in it. And uh, even the people that that were on the majority decision that made it said we made a mistake. Yeah, and so it needs to be fixed. So you have a chance to yeah. fix it. All right, John, we've got like a minute. So I'm going to skip down one to how do we really improve our schools? John, we were talking about schools earlier. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it's not smaller class sizes. It's not higher teacher pay. We've tried that, and yeah. we've gotten nothing from it. Yeah. What actually helps improve schools is giving children and parents ownership in their education. Yeah. You find the, the type of education that that child needs, and you mm -hmm. feed their education mm -hmm. through that. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's in, in one of the poorest countries in Africa, Malawi, mm -hmm. what they did is they, they have uh, laptops with self-guided iPads, basically, yeah. with self-guided programming on it. So instead of lumping everybody at a certain age into a program, you proceed at your own um, academic speed. Yeah, imagine, Shocker. Imagine that, that works. We are out of time. John, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for watching. Thanks to the crew for working hard in there tonight. Have a good night, and please remember to love everybody. Especially those people you don't think deserve it. Especially them, John. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. We've got